So here I am, fresh off some DC animated movie binge where heroes do what they do best. Kick names and take ass, or so Mantis might quip. Ah oh, wait, wrong universe. My bad. Anyway, diving into the watery world of Aquaman. Jason Momoa, a guy I've admired since his days as Ronan Dex in Stargate Atlantis. He's always been this gruff, tough guy on screen, but off screen seems like a pretty chill dude. Now, I'll be honest, when they pegged him as Aquaman, I couldn't help but scratch my head. He's not exactly the spitting image of the comic book Aquaman, or even the animated versions. But hey, when did Hollywood ever let accuracy get in the way, right? In my book, Momoa would have nailed it as Lobo. I mean, he's practically a doppelganger for the character. And mark my words, if they ever make a Lobo movie with him in the lead, count me in. So long as they do justice to the character, that is. But let's circle back to the movie. I was all set to include more snaps of Amber Heard in my review. But I hit Google and found surprisingly few Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom shots featuring her. Seems like a conscious effort by the studio. Damage control mode, maybe? They're probably aware she's become a bit of an anchor following the whole Johnny Depp trial fiasco. Plot-wise, the movie's not half bad. You've got your classic villain seeking revenge, striking up dark deals for the power needed to achieve his twisted goals. There's potential here, I reckon. But before we dive deeper, let's check in with our good old AI pal. Now, it might not have all the deets to properly dissect this flick, but it's got the entire DC movie database locked and loaded. So, let's sit tight and see what its binary brain makes of this underwater escapade, shall we? Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom submerges audiences into an enthralling aquatic spectacle that effortlessly melds a grandiose narrative tapestry with visual splendor, encapsulating the essence of heroism, familial bonds, and the looming threat of cataclysmic proportions. Jason Momoa reprises his role as Arthur Curry, embodying the dual nature of a hero torn between his terrestrial commitments and the regal duties befitting the King of Atlantis. Momoa's portrayal deftly weaves vulnerability with unwavering strength, anchoring the film in a relatable human struggle amidst the fantastical depths of an underwater kingdom. The narrative's core pivots on Arthur's juggling act between his life on land, safeguarding as a vigilante from his father's lighthouse, and his responsibilities as Atlantis ruler. This dichotomy of existence lends an intriguing layer to Arthur's character, emphasizing his dissonance with the Atlantean Council, particularly in his ambition to bridge the divide between their world and the surface. The return of Black Manta, portrayed with menacing ferocity by Yahya Abdelmateen II, propels the stakes to new heights. Fueled by vengeance and wielding the ancient and malevolent Black Trident, Manta's pursuit of retribution against Aquaman presents an ominous threat that transcends mere physical confrontation. The conflict escalates into a cataclysmic battle that imperils both realms and resonates with emotional weight. Director James Wan's visionary prowess is on full display, showcasing Atlantis in all its resplendent glory. The breathtaking underwater sequences, a symphony of vibrant colors and ethereal landscapes, immerse audiences in a world teeming with intricate detail and awe-inspiring beauty. Each frame is a visual spectacle, meticulously crafted to elevate the storytelling and evoke a sense of wonder. The film navigates through multifaceted relationships, most notably the complex dynamic between Arthur and his estranged brother Orm, portrayed with depth by Patrick Wilson. Their reluctant alliance becomes pivotal in combating the impending peril, weaving a thread of familial conflict amidst the urgency of saving their respective worlds. Amidst the adrenaline-pumping action, the film deftly intertwines pressing real-world issues. Climate change, depicted through worsening global conditions, serves as a sobering reminder of humanity's impact on the environment. This thematic undercurrent adds depth, urging audiences to ponder the repercussions of unchecked exploitation of natural resources. The climax, a crescendo of emotional resonance and high-stakes drama, culminates in sacrifices that underscore the film's exploration of unity and hope. It's a testament to the film's narrative depth, where poignant moments blend seamlessly with exhilarating action sequences. 
Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom emerges as an epic underwater odyssey, marrying top-notch performances, visionary direction, and a narrative that seamlessly weaves mythos and modernity. It's a cinematic voyage that not only entertains but also provokes contemplation on heroism, unity, and our symbiotic relationship with the natural world. In its entirety, the film leaves an indelible mark, inviting audiences to dive into a world where courage and kinship converge against the tides of adversity. So there you have it, folks. Straight from the innocent AI's mouth. It did what it could with little data it had. But let me give you my thoughts after watching these two hours worth of... Eh, let's call it fun. As a lifelong fan of the DC Universe, Aquaman never seemed to me to be one of the so-called inner circle like Batman or Superman are, but he was a badass in both comic books and the cartoon movies, and has several awesome moments when he is damn right scary. I recommend you watching The Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox cartoon movie. It's a bit dark, but you won't regret it, and you get a clear image of how tough this hero really is, and what potential there is for such a character. Instead of getting that badass character all through this latest Aquaman movie, we see the signs of hero degradation, like we saw in Thor Love and Thunder. Where a beloved badass hero slowly turned into a joke, and now see the same thing happening to Aquaman, we see his baby peeing in his mouth, not once but twice, once with the help of Amber Turd, but still... It was gross. We see an octopus peeing in Aquaman's mouth. Because humor? Or was he too manly in some of the fight scenes? And we can't really have that in Hollywood in the modern day era, so he had to be brought down. We also get a politically charged movie. Global warming. Bad. Fossil fuel. Bad. Pollution. Bad. United Nation. Good. People don't go to the movies to be lectured. They go to escape the everyday worries and all the negativity from all the social media. We just want to have one or two hours of escapism. We are all aware of what is happening in the world, and most of us do what little they can about it. But after a hard day at work, at school, or dealing with family members, all we want is some fun while watching some beautiful superheroes saving the world. No lectures, no lessons, no talking down to the audience. Just good old fun. Anyway, overall the movie is much better than the Marvels, or the latest Ant-Man movie. It's somewhere out there with Blue Beetle and Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Not great, not terrible. It has some nice moments. Aquaman and Orm had good chemistry. Also, Orm's redemption arc was nice and felt well-earned. But I feel they lost the chance to create a new meme for the internet. I liked the chemistry between Aquaman and Boba Fett. They clicked. Manta, a decent villain for a surface dweller, and even Nicole Kidman as Queen Atlanta brought her A-game. I always thought Black Manta deserved more limelight. His return in Aquaman 2 was a win for me. I'm clueless about the actor behind the mask, but given the situation, he did what he could, and that's all right by my book. But the obvious rip-off from the Lord of the Rings for the Kordax character was disturbing to me. Kordax from the comic books has a really good origin story and lore. There is even a quote saying that all Atlantean children born with blonde hair are said to have the curse of Kordax. Not sure what Warner wanted to achieve with this version of him. But there is only one King Reok, and he does not share his looks. And, surprise, surprise, a normal family unit in Hollywood. Father, mother and grandpa getting along fine. A rarity these days with all the ideologies hogging the limelight. Aquaman and Boba Fett knocking back beers on the couch? 
That's my jam. Hollywood's recent habit of axing father-son dynamics feels off. What's the deal with that? Even the scene where Aquaman is tricking his brother Orm into eating. A roach was awesome. I don't know what the actor portraying Orm was actually eating during this scene, but gotta hand it to the actor, his reaction nails it. Bear Grylls would be envious. By the way, please don't Google Bear Grylls eating bugs if you've got a sensitive stomach. Oh, Amber Turd, more screen time than expected despite her trial scandal. But mostly, she's just there. A blast to the chest might have been satisfying for some viewers, but her role felt diminished overall. The studio seemed clueless about her purpose. If they were either too cheap to hire another actress to take her place, or just disregarded how much the audiences dislike Amber Turd. Well, guess we'll never know. This movie, with a few tweaks in the casting department, could have easily hit a billion at the box office a few years ago. But reality check. It's a bland flick with a cast that feels like they've already clocked out, just trudging through the motions until the credits roll. The budget for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom weighed in at a hefty $205 million. Factor in marketing costs and the theatre's hefty cut, sometimes as much as 75% in certain regions like China. And this film needs to rake in at least $500 million just to break even. Scratch that, more likely between $550 and $600 million before it starts turning a profit. And given how it started with a $13 million opening, and how little enthusiasm and word of mouth there is for the movie, there are little chances for the movie to break even, and we are looking at another flop. How much money they will lose? Your guess is as good as mine. I would feel sorry for Momoa, Kidman, Amber Turd, or the actors playing Manta and Orb. But I'm sure they earned more money from this movie than you and me will ever earn. So I will not shed a tear for them. But we already know how the cope will be. They will blame the failure on the fans, calling us different names. Then they will blame it on superhero fatigue. Then they will blame it on each other. And will probably say that the fact that the movie flopped doesn't really matter since James Gunn will reboot the DC Universe anyway. I'm sure that that Waller movie series will bring the audiences back. I have never seen any portion of the fan base asking for a Waller movie or series, but Hollywood seems to be in its own alternate universe sometimes. I'm praying I'm wrong. I want DC, Marvel and everyone else to drop killer movies. I love hitting the theatres with friends for some 3D superhero action. Hey, Hollywood, you listening? Will you make good quality movies for the fans? Or just continue with the same bland, uninterested, formulaic and boring movies in search for that elusive modern audiences you keep looking for? If not, here is the chance for all the independent movie producers or even other countries outside the United States to start making good movies. There is an audience out there, hungry for good content. It's the end of the year 2023. Your chance is now. Announce some killer movies for 2024 or 2025 and watch the fans flock and the cash flow. The time is now. And hey, if anyone's got the lowdown on Orm's transformation from skinny Jesus to buff Captain America, please leave a note in the comments. I tried an ocean swim. Didn't work. Still got the flab. Giving it another shot tomorrow, just in case. Thanks. Signing off, folks. If this content floated your boat, give it a thumbs up and let it ride the waves. Don't forget to support your fellow YouTubers as well. 
If Hollywood won't entertain us, we'll just have to entertain ourselves. Fine. I'll do it myself. 